Welcome back, Red Spotters. Another show here in the Red Spotlight Podcast, the show that brings you all of the latest stories coming out of the world of movies and more. And what a week, man. What a week to talk about <laughs> the world of movies. Um, the week, of course, that the uh, biggest event in movies, the Academy Awards, were broadcast. And a whole bunch of crap happened. Um, and then also some movies won some awards as well. So <laughs> that's what we're discussing tonight. As well as uh, some films that Peter and I went to go see over the weekend. We will be discussing The Lost City. Starring Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum. In a feel what feels like a 2006 blast from the past uh, film. And then we also have the latest and greatest from the A24 company. It is... X horror film currently playing um, that has caused a stir with at least what is presented on screen. So that is going to be our show today here on Red Spotlight number 382. Um, so Peter, how have you been? Alive. Um, before we, we get into anything, uh, how do you think this week has gone in the world of entertainment? Oh, in the world of entertainment. I thought you meant in general. In general, horrible. I but mean, I don't care about you, but... No, in general doesn't mean me. Do you think I am... That self-obsessed? Yeah. No, 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 no. There is, of course, a war in Ukraine after all. Oh, yeah. Um... But in the world of entertainment, also terrible. Because you had the Oscars, you had Morbius, you had. Or, <laughs> I forget that. They, we just talked about it 60 seconds ago. Yeah. And when you just said its name, I, for, I, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's out right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not been the best week <laughs> for entertainment. It's not been the best week for um, big names in the entertainment industry. Not in the least. Um, and I mean several of them, not just the one big exception. Um, so, yeah, listen. A lot of things happened. Uh, things got pretty heated and pretty dramatic. And all this week, um, people have been trying to piece together what it actually means and where we go forward from here. Um, but we are going to get into all that stuff of which people I'm sure are already aware, um, happened and transpire at the Academy Awards. Um, it's interesting because usually for years now, um, we have been able to get together and see the Academy Awards and, um, for years and there've been some good shows and there've been some bad shows, um, with, I guess the most important thing that we care about are obviously the results. And so 2019 was great because there were some great fucking winners, including Parasite winning Best Picture. And in 2020, um, we also had some great winners, which was Chloe Zhao's film Nomadland and Anthony Hopkins. Although what really marred the, the, the big wins of that telecast was a series of horrible decisions um, from the people responsible for putting on the show. And again, it's, it's, it's a whole different thing. <laughs> so th- this year, what happened? So Dune, a favorite of Peter, uh, Peter's and myself, Dune walked away with six Academy Awards winning Best Editing, Cinematography, Visual Effects, Production Design, Sound Editing, and Original Score. It won six out of its ten overall nominations, which is pretty amazing. All the more amazing how this was the movie that collected the most uh, hardware and yet its director couldn't even muster a (laughs) directing nomination (laughs) From this beloved Academy. So there is that. And every single person, every single speech of all of the different crafts people that went up there to accept their Oscar, the very first person they each thanked was Denny Villeneuve. And I feel like, do they usually do that? Where 
I feel like they do where it's like they like a movie, but they're not going to give it higher. Um, whatever, like they're not going to give it best picture. They're not going to give it. Well, but they still usually nominate them, though. Yeah, that's weird that they wouldn't nominate Denny. Has he ever been nominated? He has to have been, right? Yes, with a rival. Yeah, that makes sense. That was a great one. The most recent examples, I mean, I guess we have to ask ourselves. um, Movies of this particular um, scope, like Dune, um, that have won previously were The Return of the King and Mad Max Fury Road. Return of the King won every category it was nominated for, including Best Picture. And that was the last movie of that kind to win Best Picture. Mad Max did not, but it did win a lot of Oscars, but it did get George Miller a nomination for Best Director. I have to imagine also Peter Jackson was nominated for Best Director for Return of the King. Um, What's going to be interesting is when Dune 2 comes out. Yeah. What happens then? Yeah. Especially Avatar 2 comes out there. And they usually only like one blockbuster a year, it seems like, the Academy. Um, there's Avatar 2 comes out this year. Oh, I thought it came out the same. No. No, it doesn't. Does it? Yeah. I thought it was 2023. Maybe that's Avatar 3? Oh, maybe. Okay. Never mind. Because the, <laughs> the Academy only likes one major blockbuster a year. Yeah. And I mean, that's what they did with the, the first Avatar. You mm-hmm. know, showered it with love. They did that with Mad Max. Um, you talk about like uh, Lord of the Rings. They only allow one. They, they allow one a year <laughs> where they're like this is the blockbuster that we are as the Academy allowed to like. Um, yeah. One blockbuster and nine dramas. Yeah. <laughs> yep half of which are biopics always yeah that's how you know they're real um but genuinely great to see a great movie that has so many great uh faculties at its disposal be celebrated for being the greatness that it is in particular of course greg frazier collecting it for cinematography by the way who just did the cinematography for the batman uh, and then also Hans Zimmer winning his second Oscar. It's been 28 years since he won his first Oscar uh, for score. It's crazy. This is Hans Zimmer. That's pretty crazy because he's big, big, like <laughs> pretty big. Yeah. Scores every year. Um, Multiple scores every year. Of course, this being a category that was relegated... Well, a lot of these actually were relegated to, like, uh, the undershow, as I'm going to refer to it. And then Hans couldn't even be there. Probably would have made time if they had actually, I don't know, made it an occasion. Instead, it was announced on Twitter. That's crazy. (laughs) That's so lame. It it, it was incredibly lame. Um, And then, of course, sound editing and visual effects. I mean... and. uh, actual editing itself like a lot of these just couldn't be denied and it's it's just great to see a film be rewarded for being great and i feel like these wins were probably the best examples of that happening and that isn't to say that there weren't other great wins but it it's an interesting night uh so the dune won the most with six and then the next film that won the most number of oscars that night was Coda, everybody's favorite movie that made them cry and tugged at their heart. Coda, winning three Oscars, including Best Picture, which I think with the writing was on the wall pretty clearly, and so that was the easiest call of the night. It also picked up two other prizes with um, Best Supporting Actor for Troy Kotzer, and who is deaf in real life, uh, not only just playing a deaf person in the movie, but actually deaf. And then um, Best Adapted Screenplay for Sean Hader, who is also the film's director. Mm -hmm. Over 
adapted screenplay over Dune, over Power of the Dog, Overdrive My Car. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, Coda wins three Oscars, including Best Picture. Um, Coda winning Best Picture kind of broke all the rules again because it used to be that you can't win Best Picture unless you have all of the required list of nominations. Coda did not receive a Best Editing nomination. It did not receive a directing nomination. You kind of need those to have it like a real case to win. Nope. Turns out passion went out again this time. And the passion was on Coda's side. By the way, and I'm I'm curious how no one's pointed this out. Coda continues the trend of as of late with one uh word titles winning best picture. Coda, Nomadland, Parasite, Moonlight, Spotlight. Argo. They sound so official, don't they? Yeah. Just like, boom, there it is. Like Madonna. Birdman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they... The only ones that have broken that in the last few years was gr uh, Green Book, which was two words, and I believe The Shape of Water. Yes. Green Book sounds like one word, though. Yeah. So... That's an interesting thing I noticed there. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, yeah. But of all the choices to make, this is the one that they go with. But I, I, I want to be clear about this because I feel like... I agree with everyone out there, and I believe you also said this as well, Peter, that Coda's win is not nearly... As terrible as the green as Green Books win, yeah, not by any means, because Coda is a much better movie. It also has um, better representation, um, better authenticity to it um, for the you know their intended communities, and that's always a positive thing to see. Um, it's just also very, very even even though. Coda's far superior of a pick than Green Book was as a Best Picture winner. How the hell does Coda compare to any of the movies I just name-dropped? Nomadland, Birdman, Moonlight, Spotlight, Parasite. I don't think that movie comes close in quality to any of those. So that's interesting right there. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Whatever. So, uh, the only other film that night to win more than one Oscar was The Eyes of Tammy Faye. The bio picks everybody currently streaming on HBO Max. It won uh, the Oscar for Best Makeup and Hairstyling, and it also won the Oscar for Best Actress, Jessica Chastain's first Academy Award. Oh, reach your heart out, Grace. Uh, I haven't seen The Eyes of Tammy Faye. I hear it was very mixed to it not so good. It was a biopic. Yeah. So it's, it, it is what it is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, but again, it's one of those films that I would probably isn't all that great, but guess what? The performance was great, I would imagine. And that's why Jessica won. I, I'm not terribly upset at all with this because... I do love Jessica Chastain as an actor, and it's nice to see her have a moment. So that's nice to see. Although, if I'm looking at um, that category in and of itself, there were some other wonderful choices they could have gone with, including Penelope Cruz in Parallel Mothers. She was great in that movie. Also, Kristen Stewart in Spencer, who, in all honesty, should have won this in the cakewalk because she gave the best performance, at least with my view. But okay. There was that. Um Yeah. Yeah. So now let's get to quickly these other winners. Mm -hmm. And stop me if you have anything to say about this. Or any of these. So um Best Supporting Actress went to Ariana DeBose for West Side Story. Of course, the only win for West Side Story that entire night. She was great. Um, she was great. It was well-deserved. I don't think anybody had gave it a second thought. Like mm -hmm. She was amazing. She became the first openly queer person to win um, an Academy Award. Is she gay? Yeah. Oh. 
That's what she said. Is that what she said? Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, I know in, in the yeah. United States, in, you need to declare it, I think. Apparently. It's in the bylaws, yeah. Unless you're in Florida. Hmm. Yeah, but she was amazing. Um, she got a, she gave an amazing speech, uh, and I believe she's like the um. I forget what the actual stat he is here, but basically, this is the same. This is the first time that um another actor has won an Academy Award for the same role that another actress won an Academy Award for. Because Rita Moreno won the Academy Award oh. for this character. In 1962. That's right. Uh, with the original West Side Story. And now so does Ariana DeBose. For, for the, the same, same character. character. Yeah, that's probably... Well, the Joker, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the Joker is because, like... Those are adaptations. And I guess with West Side Story, there's much... There's... Well... It's... Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a small club of people. Mm-hmm. Um, So there is that. And in all honesty, I kind of block out that Joaquin Phoenix scene, so <laughs> we don't talk about the Joker. Mm. Um, Speaking so of that. we don't talk about. Yeah. Uh, Encanto wins Best Animated mm. Feature Film. You know what was funny? Because mm. uh, I watched the show and I heard it's always funny to gauge like the reaction from the audience to see like which, you know, which movie they like cheer for more. Mm-hmm. It wasn't Encanto. When they were calling out the nominees. Which one was it? It was Mitchell's. You know what? They pushed real hard for Mitchell. Netflix pushed, pushed real hard. I have to commend Netflix. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, they were more gunning for Power of the Dog winning Best Picture, which it did not, obviously. But I really have to commend them for running a great campaign on behalf of Mitchell's versus the Machines. And honestly, I think it would have won had... Disney not, not been released this <laughs> Well, you know what? <laughs> well, t- if we're being real, this category wouldn't exist if Disney <laughs> hadn't existed in the first place. I think um, people are, are getting tired of it. It's ridiculous. And, and the thing is, in a year like this, it's harder to be mad at it because Encanto's a great movie. Mm-hmm. And I don't think anybody like would disagree would say like it didn't deserve to win luca also i would say deserved to win like, they were great animated films this year the thing is disney is so over awarded like it, it comes to the point where like this is just the disney award yeah. you know i'm hearing an airplane over there too mm-hmm. this is great guys um the fucking airplanes hovering all over our damn our uh, town i guess we're being invaded um and it's finally it's just like I hope the microphones are not picking up on that, but there is that. Um, no, but there were audible cheers. The loudest cheers were for Mitchell's, and I, I could hear the tiniest bit of disappointment when Encanto's, uh, in the crowd, I mean, when Encanto's name was called out. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just because, like, Encanto is great, but it it just it didn't feel anything new. Right? Well, it's just like Disney it's- again. Well, I guess, I think the the real, like, point where I was like, damn, like, this is just, you know they don't pay attention, they don't care, is when the Lego movie wasn't nominated, right? Yeah. Like, that was crazy. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I, for sure, every category, I don't think they really watch that much or pay attention that much, right. the Academy voters, but it, especially when it comes to animation, because... Uh, they probably don't take animation that seriously. No, they don't. And it's like, it, it's changed in recent years. And again, that also explains why, you know, other like discrepancies, why it was that um, Brave defeated Big Hero 6. No, excuse me. Brave defeated Wreck-It Ralph that one year for best animated feature. Mm-hmm. It explains Lego Movie not getting nominated. It explains Lego Batman Movie not getting nominated. It also explains Klaus losing the Toy Story 4. Um, and now this with Mitchell's losing to Encanto, but I, and I, I keep hearing this. I think, I think it's universally agreed upon, at least from our community that Mitchell's is a better movie than Encanto. It's just the, the thing is Encanto came out, uh, came out more recently than Mitchell's did. It hit pretty And big. it also has the songs. Mm-hmm. The songs are pretty fucking powerful. 
And I think the change that happened lately with this category and these last several years is the fact that before, I think I want to say in the early 2010s, the only Oscar voters that were allowed to vote for animated feature were the animated, uh, the people who, the Oscar voters that were in the animated field that, that worked in the animated like aspect that were animators. But then that changed in the later 2010s where now the entirety of the Academy, like the whole 9,000 some members can now vote on every single category. Uh, yeah, I don't like that. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like having actors decide basically every award because they kind of make up a big chunk of everything. And I feel like the actors have really uh, had a big influence lately in years because I know that especially that group was the first one Coda hit really hard with and they kept pushing and pushing and pushing it. And when you have like just any like big section of the Academy voters that are engaged. All the other ones so just many- listen. Dip. They go where the wind blows them. So, yeah, it's... It was okay. It was fine. I mean, I guess it was nice to see Byron Howard um, win his second Oscar. Um, won the first one with Zootopia, now with uh, directing. I mean, he directed Zootopia, now he directed Encanto. So, so yeah. Um, okay, the other winners we had here, Best Director. This is another strange, um, couple of things to say about this one. Jane Campion, one director, uh, for The Power of the Dog. First thing. Jane Campion is only the third woman to win Best Director at the Academy Awards. 94 years. Not great. (laughs) No. Um... Remember, this is also Jane Campion is the first woman to get nominated a second time for Best Director. Um, this is the first time that we've had two um, female winners in a row for Best Director, the Chloe Zhao and then Jane Campion. You know what also makes this strange? And I feel like this is, I think, all the evidence you need to say that the Academy was just so swayed by recency bias, as they usually are, but more in this case. The Power of the Dog received 12 Oscar nominations about a month and a half ago. This is the only one they won. Because they were hot a month and a half ago. Yeah. And now they are not. But it's also pretty strange because you think like, oh, it only won one Oscar? All right, which one did it win? Best Director? Huh. Usually, if your movie wins Best Director, it also picks up something else. To me, it makes sense, though, because I feel like the movie only got traction because of the director and the directing. Yeah. Like, the whole reason was because they all in love with Jane, Jane Campion and, and, and stuff. Like uh-huh. That. So, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not really necessarily, like, opposed to it. I think it was a deserved win. All right. Original screenplay went to Kenneth Branagh for Belfast. Um, I don't like that. I mean, I'm happy for him. Mm -hmm. He's a fairly charming person, but um, it was either going to be this or Don't Look Up or King Richard. (laughs) And I don't care about any of those. So I want to Don't Look Up just so uh, David Sorota could go up there and be like, climate change. Get some recognition. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know who else was also nominated here was Paul Thomas Anderson for Licorice Pizza. Ooh. That would have been a cool win to see, but it wasn't. Uh, went to Belfast. Uh, also, a documentary feature, which was completely upstaged by drama. Um, fuck, I hate this because this is, this is, I love Questlove um, <laughs> and I love his movie. Um, and Summer of Soul won a uh, documentary feature. We should also say Flea went 0-3 the entire night. Nominated for animation, documentary, and international, and it lost all three of them. Yeah. You would have think because it got, like, it was the first film to get nominations in all those categories. It would have at least won one of them. Yeah. (laughs) Didn't happen. But you know what? Summer Soul is a great documentary. I think it's um, beyond deserved. Um, And yeah. You know what really sucks for Questlove? Like, I think, like, 
he is now like this is the second year in a row where at the Academy Awards he um had to follow up some, some fucking bullshit. drama <laughs> because last year remember like he was like the DJ mm-hmm. at the little venue that they had and they tossed it over to him to close off the show after the fiasco that was the non-present Anthony Hopkins winning the Oscar from the deceased Chadwick Boseman and the whole audience is like wait what just happened and then like the producers tossed it to him to tell everybody good night and and then this this here is even worse because he won his first Oscar for a project that's obviously very special to him and nobody heard a single word he said. Everyone was too concerned <laughs> with other mishaps. But I feel for him, though. But you know what? Congratulations. You got that Oscar hey, you deserve it. Who, you know, at the end of the day, you, you've got a fucking Oscar, you know? Who cares? Yeah. He's another one that I was very excited to see, even though it was predetermined, but I was happy. International feature, Drive My Car. One of my favorite films of the year, well-deserved, unbelievably deserved. I think in in the best of circumstance, in a better year, Drive My Car would have been much more of a force for Best Picture and Director. It wasn't, but that's how, that's the hand that they were dealt. But it was very happy to see Rasuke Hamaguchi go up in there. Um, and, and, and props to him for powering through the speech um, with um, his English. Like he had a, he had a, a thick accent, but he... He even had a translator there next to him, and she was, like, waiting for him to cue her, and he didn't do that. So he was trying to, like, get to the speech. And it was hard to do that because the Academy tried to play him off three times. That's crazy. Nobody else that night, I want to be honest, I saw the entire thing. Not many playoffs. No one else, no one else that night got played off or was... Well, I guess... You, that should at least be that since you cut out so much other shit, right? Like, no playoffs. No, they st- And I just, like, in that moment, I'm like, why do they always try and play off the Asian winners? Remember how they tried playing off the car- the, the cast of Parasite when it won Best Picture? Yeah. <laughs> and everyone had to be like, shut the... Let them talk. Boo. Boo. <laughs> It was bad. Yeah. Um, but happy for him. Um, and I'm happy to see the films that he makes next because he is uh, someone that is considered to be a rising star um, in this lovely world we call, we call cinema. Um, oh, costume design. May I present to you Academy Award winner Cruella. Um, yeah. It was, uh, what, what was it? Uh, Jenny Beaven. One uh, for Cruella, and she was also nominated before for the costumes for Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah, I can see that. So I feel like costumes the the more showy there. I mean, crazy costumes, right? So the costumes in Cruella were great. I'm not I'm not at all mad with this win, especially since like House of Gucci was like just terrible. <laughs> Not even fun. It's just terrible. And I don't think it was nominated here. No, I don't think it was. You know what was so, nominated? Dune. Dune. Yeah. And I gotta say, and, yeah, I think it should have won. I'm gonna believe that. I think Dune deserved a lot of Oscars. No, I don't think it deserved this one. West Side Story. West Side Story. What about West Side Story? I mean, they're nice, but they're ba- the whole point is that they're basically dressed okay. like it's not well, we like know a why big Cruella deal. won it because like they had the flashiest. Oh yeah, costumes. it's the flashiest. It's yeah. the same thing with like everything else. Yeah, the, the flashier aspects of it. That's the one that wins. Okay. Um, original song went to Billie Eilish and Phineas uh, for No Time to Die, the song from the James Bond movie, No Time to Die. She gave a great performance of that song at the uh, telecast. And it was also a no-brainer because look at its competition. It was a random Beyonce song that really nobody liked from King Richard. It opened the show. Mm-hmm. Nobody remembers that. 
Um, Dos Orgullitas uh, from Encanto that was performed by Sebastian Yatra and good for him, but it's a song from a film that has better songs and more well-known songs and that wasn't nominated. Uh, Down to Joy from Belfast. That's not even available on digital, so that song doesn't even exist for all intents and purposes. Yeah. Then you have Somehow You Do from a movie the featuring that featured Mila Kunis called Four Good Days. No one has had heard of this movie. The only reason it was nominated was because it was written by Diane Warren. And this was her 13th nomination in this category and her 13th loss uh, for Best Original Song. I was going to say, what her- movie? With- what? <laughs> <laughs> Somehow You Do was the name of the of the song and the movie was Four Good Days. No one had heard I of it. it. It was performed by Reba at the show because she recorded the song. But get this, Diane Warren's first nomination uh, for Best Original Song came in the 1980s. She just lost for the 13th time in a row, and she lost it to somebody who is now the first ever Oscar winner to have been born in the 21st century. Yeah, I was going to say she's pretty young. (laughs) <laughs> yeah um good for her yeah yeah and I guess she may even be nominated next year for her work in uh, Turning Red you I know didn't what even not, uh, yeah god damn it see that's another thing where it's like that would be such a fun performance like do the whole boy band thing uh huh if they end up getting nominated, and if they, I feel like they have to. Well, we don't talk about Bruno didn't get a nomination, and yet they made time for that song, and yet they still fumbled it. They're really good at fumbling things, I gotta say. They really are. <laughs> like, you can always count on them to fumble. I wanted to ask you in real time about this movie. So the category is live action short film, and it won, uh, it went to. The Long Goodbye, a film by Riz Ahmed, um, director and then also starring in it. It's available on YouTube right now. I would prefer to include this in my like list of movies that I saw, but here's the problem. On Letterboxd, it says that it was actually debuted in 2020. Uh... But then the Oscars nominated it in 2021, and it won an Oscar in 2021. And I'm just so confused as to like what what what's the story there? It was probably of a, a small festival debut, well, mm-hmm. but like I, that usually doesn't matter, I guess, with like short films, right? Because short films don't get wide releases. No. Um, yeah, I don't know. Hmm. We'll have to because I guess, discuss. I, that. I wanted to say, well, like, will it won an Oscar? Just say yes. But like, I'm including. Uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. I am too. Year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because because... And, and I guess I, can't, I guess that kind of goes against what we said because <laughs> Judas won Oscars last yeah, year. Yeah, that's why. I'm but it was a 2021 like... movie. But then again, that was a feature length film, and it had a wide release by Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. This is a short film, and short films operate differently. Yeah, I don't know. It's a tough call because Long Goodbye is genuinely great. I mentioned this in the chat. One of the most harrowing things I've ever seen in my life. Um, that's the word I keep coming back to, harrowing. Um, there's a turn that happens in this very short film, and it's it, it doesn't hold back. Oh, gosh. No, it doesn't hold back. Um, let's just say it ends with bullets flying and there are bodies on the floor. Um, and it's pretty fucking powerful. And... It made me feel physically ill after I saw it. That's not a selling <laughs> point, I, I guess. I was going to say. <laughs> oh, sounds like a hell of a time. You can find it on YouTube, guys. Um, it's only a short film, but it's still... You're going to be left with like... Well, that's terrible. Um, so I guess we'll have to decide about what to do about the long goodbye documentary short. I also saw this one, the queen of basketball. It's only 20 minutes. It's pretty good. It's about this, um, basketball player, um, from a long time ago. And she had a, she made history 
And then as history goes, people forgot about her. But now not anymore because it won an Oscar. So there's that. The Windshield Wiper won Best Animated Short, which I also saw and didn't care for. Hmm. But I may have just been tired of short films. <laughs> Sometimes my, my attention span just goes. All right. Um, and those, ladies and gentlemen, were the Academy Awards. Not bad. Pretty good winners all around. I think you missed one award. Which one? Hardest Slap. Oh. <laughs> Hardest Slap. <laughs> I didn't even do this on purpose, I swear to God. I completely forgot to bring up who won Best Actor. I'm so sorry. I I guess my mind just, like, blurred that <laughs> shit out. Um... Yeah, uh, yeah. Best actor went to uh, as we predicted. By the way, um, William, we got a lot of these right. Yeah, uh, very predictable this year. Yeah, Will Smith for King Richard. William <laughs> Smithers. <laughs> I can't believe I fucking blocked that shit. I thought we were done. It's like, wait, you forgot one. <laughs> um, I mean, I said I always wanted him to win just so he would stop making these kinds of films. So. Here's hoping. I don't know how... Um, I have to think that maybe the hope that these kind of films would stop being made by him was maybe kind of like fool's gold because as you are aware now, mm -hmm. just this week I became aware and I shared with you that Apple TV Plus... By the way, Apple TV Plus made history. This this Academy's award by being the first streaming service to win Best Picture, beating Netflix. That beating Netflix. I genuinely think there's an anti-Netflix bias. And with Coda of all movies, oh, it won Best Picture. That and think hurts of all of the films because the superior version of Coda made by Netflix lost. Which one? Oh, sorry, not Coda. <laughs> sorry, I was thinking of Belfast. You? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Belfast didn't have a streaming service behind mm -hmm. it. I forget who it was, but I I see what you were saying. Yeah. Now. Uh, did you ever up. see Belfast? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I was I right about what it was like Roma Light. Yeah, it's Roma Light. Yeah. I like Jude Hill, the the kid in the movie. He's he's cool. He's cute. You know what's funny? Coda feels like a a Netflix film, isn't it? I guess. Uh, uh yeah, Netflix. I think you're. I've been on that train for years, and I I think it's made more apparent. Like Netflix has been trying for years to win Best Picture, um, with many great films, and always coming up short. Um, it got pretty close with Roma and Power of the Dog, but at the last minute, that didn't happen. But then they also received 27 nominations this year at the Academy Awards, and they only won a single oh. cat. They won one. That's so crazy. Because people talk about like, oh, they were nominated seven times, and they didn't win one. And it's like, they think that's crazy, but 27 nominations. Just in one year. In one win. I really do think there is a a bias against Netflix. I do. It's crazy. It's insane. Um, but Apple TV Plus later this year has a film with Will Smith where apparently he plays a slave. Which, I mean, <laughs> it's unfortunate for a number of reasons. I guess what makes that sigh you just gave is like, this is every this is every Oscar movie ever. Why? Like basically the the nomination's already in the bag if you play a slave and if you're already an Oscar winner, like it's already like half in the bag. This is the thing. I'm not saying Will Smith is a bad actor because he's not a bad actor. Clearly not. He just won yeah. an acting award. <laughs> he's a good actor, but I feel like. All of his performances are just different accents. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think he's a good actor playing one role. And they just all have to, because it's, uh, to me, it's always the same. Like he, yeah. you know, he gets angry and he gets those, those like red eyes and he's like kind of holding back tears and he's yelling and like, that's his performance and it's well done, but that's every performance. Including you know. the one on Sunday. Yes. <laughs> including that performance. Um, I don't know. I feel it's, I, he I feel like he doesn't play different. I don't know. Maybe it's in my head. Maybe I'm tired. But I feel like whenever I think of like Will Smith acting, it's always Will Smith. Yeah. He has different accents. <clears throat> but, you know, every time it's 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 good performance. Like, he, I'll put it this way. By good performance, I mean like he's really good at conveying anger or sadness or confusion, or, you know, whatever said character is supposed to feel in that moment. But he's not good at transforming himself. It's always like, what if Will Smith ha uh, was a doctor about concussions? What if Will Smith... <laughs> it's just, it's hard to shake the, the public image, right? Mm -hmm. That people already know Will Smith to But be. I think other actors do it. No, they do it, mm -hmm. but he doesn't. Yeah. And I think maybe the first time he actually did, I guess, um, shave that image was this past Sunday. He's like a Oscar caliber version of, I think, The Rock. That's what I was thinking of, honestly. Yeah. But I like Will Smith more. Yeah. Because well, he can act. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm glad he won. I am too. I uh, well, we'll get into the whole thing that happened in a bit. I think he was definitely deserving, although considering what's come to light in retrospect, I would have preferred somebody like a Nick Cage who was not nominated, which is a shame, or a Hidetoshi Nishijima who also was not nominated. But I'm looking at the people who were nominated, guys. Andrew Garfield's right there. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, this man probably has been owed an Oscar since The Social Network 10 years ago. And you're still just, like, stringing him along. Like, hello? Um, now that you mention it, I think Hitatashi should have been nominated and won. I agree with you. I think uh, by yeah. far gave the best performance. Absolutely. And if not him, there was Nick Cage. He was also right there as well. Also and really that good. Also completely ignored. <laughs> he was really good in the same role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. They don't have to do an American remake of uh, Drive My Car. It's literally Pig. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's great. They, I love wait, it. is that still happening? What? Is that happening for reals? No. Oh, okay. I was like... But I'm just saying that usually always happens. Like, right oh, after God. Parasite 1, remember? They're like, oh, we're going to do an American version of What this. a stupid idea. Which, to be fair, is about as stupid as, like, remaking West Side Story. <laughs> and then that somehow was pulled off. They at least um, waited 60 years. Yeah, at least you waited. <laughs> You gave it some space. Yeah, it's definitely space. Before something there. else happened. Uh, what was the other thing I was going to say just now? Um, no, you're, you're, I think you're 100% correct about that. Um, but yeah. Mm. So, should we talk about the show itself? Or the controversy next? Um, I think they're one and the same, right? Well, yeah, but one is obviously, like, s pretty elaborate, and the other one is just kind of, um, not? Oh. I'm talking about, like, the broadcast presentation. Oh. The quality of it and the choices that were made. <sighs> Did you see a lot of the clips that I sent over? Yeah. Okay, so you, you, you pretty, you basically saw it. Uh-huh. What did you okay? Let's start off with the the biggest thing that going into the night was the fact that eight categories. You know what? Oh, fine. We'll just do this now. We'll do it. 
The biggest fail of the night, the single biggest fail of the night, was the fact that you said that you were going to make the show three hours tops. Never mind the fact that you cut out eight categories. And at no point did you even, did you make a promise or even think, you, you basically they admitted that they cut out those eight categories a few weeks back with no intention of shortening up the three hour runtime. They cut out those categories so they can have Amy Schumer hanging from the ceiling dressed as Spider-Man. So they can have Regina Hall uh, grope Josh Brolin and Jason Momoa. So they can have Amy Schumer go out and do a lame ass seat filler bit with Kirsten Dunst and um, Jesse Plemons that was halfway insulting. So we can have Wanda Sykes do a tour of the Academy Museum. All of those, by the way, were actual bits that happened on the show. Mm -hmm. And they all were lame as hell. Because it's the exact same <laughs> shtick that happens every year. And it doesn't get any better. And the more you do this, the worse it gets. I don't know what it is about the Academy that makes... That just saps the talent out of entertainers. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter how good or how funny they are. The second you get the gig to host, it, it's like it's just... It leaves your body. It's like in Space Jam. <laughs> and they sapped the talent <laughs> with, with, the, with the basketball. Um, yeah, because those are... Like, you explained it. Yeah, it's like every fucking year. Like, oh, seat... There's, I feel like I've seen a lot of seat filler jokes. The whole thing of like, okay, what was big this year? Spider-Man. I'm in a Spider-Man costume. Okay. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't... I don't know what it is. Like I said, I think they need to give the entertainer, like, a year. Yeah, to prep for this. Yeah. Like, hire somebody tomorrow. Yeah, for sure. Get, like, hire them tomorrow and be like, hey, you're gonna host the next Oscars. And I guess in today's world, they're just worried that <laughs> they're gonna get canceled Kevin Hart. by then. <laughs> The second that they announce it for the next year, someone's going to be digging through their old tweets or old Maybe interviews. Maybe don't announce it then. I mean, the, the, what, keep it hidden? I, you can't do that. I don't know. So, yeah, they, so all of those bits stayed in and they cut out eight categories. And I think the biggest damning indictment out of all of that was this was the longest Oscars broadcast I can remember. This was three hours and 42 minutes long. Are you serious? No, no. Yeah, I'm being serious. Three That's hours insane. and 42 minutes. Best picture was announced at the three hour and 40 minute mark. I genuinely don't know. <laughs> like, I've watched these things and I don't know what's happening that makes it th this long. It's... It's something else. And you know what makes it funnier? They cut out eight categories. You cut out eight categories and added 42 minutes. How do you do that? It's like, if that isn't, if that isn't like a representation of how bad the Academy is at doing anything, I don't know what is. You know what? But guess what? 60% higher viewership than last year. Yeah, 60% higher viewership. Uh, last year was the lowest rated Academy Awards ever with 10 million viewers. It was a 60% increase to 15, or actually I think 16 or so million viewers, which is substantial definitely in these days. I mean, let's be real. 10 million viewers is still substantial for anything in, in television these days because no one's watching television Yeah, no anymore. one gives a shit. But 15 viewers, 15 million viewers is pretty, is even better. So that's great for them. Um, I have to be honest with you. I want to know what drove people to actually see it. I can't, I can't think that the Will Smith thing happened. Then everybody was like, okay, turn on the TV and watch this shit. That's how it works. That's the power <laughs> of TV. Because that happened at least two and a half hours into the show. Mm -hmm. So. And guess what? I'm sure if you were watching the um, 
I don't know the the viewership numbers live. <laughs> they spiked. They would have gone. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there is there, there's that, and then also it's just genuinely terrible. I love Ryan Johnson's um sass tweets that <laughs> night. Did you see the, the tweets? Yeah. He literally was like laughing at them after the whole thing was over. <laughs> What a disaster the show was. And then he also like called out the bullshit that they were for like the eight uh, categories that they announced before the actual show. Like, you know, in the in the actual like audit, the Dolby theater, um, they were announcing those eight other categories while the red carpet was happening. So, yeah. and they were edited into the actual telecast. But let me be honest with you, like the it, they they just felt like non-events. They were like, and this person also won. Bye. <laughs> As we cut to commercial. And everyone talks about how, like, you didn't give Den You didn't have Denzel giving Samuel L. Jackson an Oscar at the you actual you, Oscars? Or at the very least clip out something to show at the actual Oscars? Like, dump Wanda Sykes' lame, like, Academy Museum bit and show Denzel Washington's speech and then Sam Jackson getting his honorary Oscar. That's insane that they wouldn't do something. <laughs> but, like, there's so many things they could do with it and they don't do that. So, that was a bust and I genuinely felt bad for all those people. Um... I will say to be somewhat positive to them, the hosts that were Amy Schumer, Regina Hall, and Wanda Sykes very much exceeded my expectations. <laughs> they didn't shit themselves on stage? No, no. In fact, they were actually pretty good. As a dynamic together, they were actually pretty good. Pretty good. Some of the best hosts... Um, they've had in a while. Mm. Any, any, I mean, any award show. They weren't like spectacular. Don't get me wrong. And I'm, of course, I'm operating with very low expectations. But they did a very good job, and they actually delivered some pretty good jokes that weren't like the cringe fest that I thought it was going to be. And in particular, Amy Schumer had some wonderful jabs, some of which were kind of like mean-spirited that's like kind of shocking for somebody not named Ricky Gervais to like deliver like they took pretty fucking like hard like hits at don't look up and being the Ricardos did you see those jokes no so like Amy Schumer was like up there she was saying like don't look up was nominated for this this and that and then her next line was like I guess critics don't look up reviews <laughs> to that's pretty funny know, it is. And then with being Ricardo's, she was like praising like Aaron Sorkin as like one of her favorite filmmakers. And then she was like saying like only a genius like Aaron Sorkin can make a movie about Lucille Ball and have the brilliant decision to not make it funny at all. <laughs> and then they cut to like J.K. Simmons and Nicole Kidman like sitting right there. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Their fucking that, reactions. That's going to be so... um. <laughs> Because it's such bullshit. Because they, they know what's cut. Kind of, like the camera people are like they have them right there. They're like, whoa, we're gonna get this reaction shot. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised she wasn't the one that got hit that night. <laughs> right. Like. <laughs> I mean, she even dissed King Richard when she was like, uh, saying that, uh, what a great year it was for you know stories of representation in women. And they made they finally made a story about uh the Williams sisters' dad. <laughs> it's true. And, yeah. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. Um and then she was making the usual jokes about how she just like watched none of the movies except for Encanto. Um because that's the only movie that anybody saw. But it was actually pretty good. It was actually pretty funny. And hey, if it's funny, that's all I care about. And I wasn't expecting to actually be laughing. Um, this was a weird thing though. The worst part of that whole thing was DJ Khaled coming out and doing his DJ Khaled. Now let me introduce to you these hosts. Here's this person. Here's that person. Bye. They literally had him there to, to, to do that. I told you. <laughs> That's just his job. 
He just comes out and yells his name. Yeah, it was um completely unnecessary. Um The In Memoriam, I know a lot of people were offended at the In Memoriam because they had like performers and singers, but I thought it was pretty beautiful because they act they devoted like five and a half minutes to the In Memoriam. Whereas last year it was like it was like musical chairs. Yeah. Here's this person, that person, bye. Bye-bye. That was <laughs> And it was like, that was like the funniest in memoriam I've seen last year's. I mean, I, there should be like a side by side comparison, but um, it was nice. It was a nice in memoriam, I would say. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, again, eight actual categories were cut from the main presentation. But you know what wasn't cut from the main presentation were two revealed moments of uh, Twitter fan polls. One of which was for best cheer moment, and then the other one was for, like, fan favorite film. And I didn't see. How did they do? Did they actually have someone walk to a podium and, like... Thankfully, they didn't. Okay. They didn't make it that much of a spectacle. So what happened was, both of those individual moments, they were not presented one after the other. They were, like, spaced out, like, an hour in between. And they basically um, announced them as they were, as they were transitioning to commercial... However, they did play the reel of the results for the audience in the Dolby Theater. How and based embarrassing. On re- and I heard it, but I also confirmed on Twitter in real time to make sure nobody clapped. What is there to clap for? It's just nobody clapped, and both of them went to Zack Snyder films. This is this, this is actually the first one is pretty funny because the best apparently it wasn't exclusive to like films that came out in 2021. It was like I guess of all time. So like they had moments from Dreamgirls, um, what? Like old movies. I don't. I it's you didn't see this. That's so stupid. This isn't it. Like you didn't. You, oh my god! I have to look this up. Because it was it was weird because like they were I, I didn't understand it myself. Like, how did that happen? I thought it was supposed to be for films that were new. Here it is. The top five cheer worthy moments um, that was literally this was presented at the Dolby Theater and then to us at home. At number five, The Matrix from 1999, Neo Dodging Bullets. What year is this? Why? Number four, uh, Dream Girls, Effie White, which is Jennifer Hudson's character singing I'm Telling You. Number three, Avengers Endgame, the Avengers assemble to fight Thanos. So they play those clips of those films. None of those films are from, the, from this year. Then comes number two, a film that's actually from this year, Spider Man No Way Home, the three Spider Men team up. And then number one was from Zack Snyder's Justice League, The Flash enters the Speed Force. And you know what? This particular moment was received with such comedy on film Twitter. It was so, so funny to see in real time. Even just to see that presented at the Oscars was like... And you, and we know why that happened. Mm-hmm. It's because the... The Snyder people on Twitter, they, I don't know, like, this is their whole life. I just, I cannot believe they looked at those results and they actually showed it. Because that is like the physical, that is like the actual representation of the Academy being owned by the Snyder fan base. This is the thing. I thought they would just lie. (laughs) Why didn't they? I thought they would, like, play, um, (laughs) the, uh... They would just say, like, oh, no, actually, Spider-Man won. <laughs> yeah. Even if it didn't make sense, even if the votes... I like, know, who cares? <laughs> That's really funny, though. Yeah. And it's made it even funnier because I, like, when, when that came on, I, I forgot that scene existed. Um, But it was a good laugh. And I guess you make it funnier now because who's in that scene? 
um, Ezra oh, Miller. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> also, Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead won the fan favorite poll. How embarrassing, man. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you, you really, like, every year, it's like, we're just so amazed. Like, how much more embarrassing can the Academy get? And yet, we come back and it's like, well, they hit a new low. I <laughs> see. My suggestion was always to just play it like, to announce it to the people at home. Right. Yeah, don't show don't it in the, in, show in the theater. Don't show it in the theater cuz no one there gives a fuck. This And they did it. Nobody clapped. If, what's <laughs> there to clap for? Like I'm if you're in the theater like that shit means nothing to you. That stuff is for the viewers at home for so they can hear. That's why I always said it would be interesting to have like uh, and again not through a Twitter poll cuz that shit is just <laughs> It's going to get corrupted very easily. Well, at the very least, like, regulate it. Like, at least have the foresight to, like, give them options. Don't, like, let them give you options. Well, just do it on a website. I think there's ways to make sure you can only vote once, or, or at least one computer votes yeah, once. Yeah, there are, yeah. Um, so, yeah, just do it through, through the some Academy website and just, like, you know, who did people at home vote for best actor or whatever but don't have it like some rant don't have like jared leto for morbius be able to win right have it actually be people of of the five that are nominated people vote mm -hmm. on that don't just let them vote for literally anyone and it's the same with this uh twitter poll or whatever yeah they should have collected the the movies that they for sure wanted to win and then only those films. Because <laughs> if you leave it wide open, the internet's going to do what it does. Or just like give them the 10 movies that actually got nominated for Best Picture and let the people see who yes. they would have chosen. That's what, I, that's what I'm saying. Do it for every category. Yeah. Actor, supporting actor, Best Picture. It could be fun. Just, to, it's just yeah. as a thing, as me, a viewer watching along, be like, oh, like, okay, who did everyone else want to win? Oh. Yeah, like for example, like you they went with the they went with Cruella for the costumes and the people could have wanted Dune. Yeah, I could see Dune winning for the costumes. I would have been like, oh hey, a lot of people Because I mean, what do we do? We we do it all the time leading up to like who do we think is gonna win? Who do we think should win, right? Yeah. And this is just engaging everyone in that same discussion yeah. of like, oh, who do we think should win? Um Well, I think that would be cool. <laughs> All right. Now the performances. Uh, for the most part, they were pretty whatever, and that's not great. Beyonce's performance, I d I couldn't understand what that was. I don't remember any actual. She singing. was a tennis ball. It was. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sebastian Yatra's. It was. It was decent. It was good. Um, it's just the song isn't great. I mean, the song's great. It's just like, it's just not the kind of song you want to like, that gets you up and going and everything. Mm -hmm. um, Reba's performance was fine. Uh, she's good at uh, giving a live performance as usual. Uh, the song wasn't very good. Um, Billie Eilish pretty much took it because she literally gave the best performance in a cakewalk. And it, and it could have been like, they were, one of the things that they were like... Um, Promoting very much was the the first live performance of We Don't Talk About Bruno. Did you see it? No, but I heard it was like a complete bait and switch. Yeah. I, they had the actors from the actual like film perform it and then like they switched out the middle the one of the major verses with some artist I had never heard of. And it, it it's just so fucking jarring because then it cut and she's doing a rap about their Oscars and like inserting the See, Oscars into the song. I guarantee you, the Academy thought they were really fucking clever. And they're like, "Oh, you know this song everyone wants to hear. We're gonna incorporate the night. We're gonna be who's a big singer rapper. Let's bring them in. They probably thought it was a really cool idea. It's not. 
you know what would have been a really cool idea? Just do the fucking song. They couldn't just leave well enough alone. No. They couldn't. And then it was pretty bad. It was just, yeah, it was confusing. And um, lame. Pretty much lame. So there's that. Um, There were also some pretty... um, I don't know. Wanda Sykes came out one time and she was doing this bit where um, she was holding up a screener of The Last Duel and then pretty much like making a joke about nobody saw it. And that just didn't see it sit right with me mm-hmm. because it's like that was a genuinely great film and it probably would be here if people saw it. For a show that's about loving film... There's always like a lot of, I feel, animosity towards film within the Oscars. Yeah. This is the one place you shouldn't be making a movies are boring and lame and no one watched it kind of jokes. One of the jokes Wanda Sykes had in her monologue was that she's seen Power of the Dog three times and um, she's almost halfway through it. (laughs) If all the jokes are about how movies suck, then it's like, well, why are we here? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, it's just I don't know what's going to change. But overall, though, it was I think a superior broadcast than last year because it was definitely more entertaining in every way imaginable. So, um, Peter, um, yeah. Oh, I, I guess I'll say this: If they announce that I guess Amy Schumer will come back, and and there, I wouldn't be angry. But I think you also have better options as well. Um, so start looking. Anyway, Will Smith. I saw I saw it in in real time. Mm-hmm. I want I want to know your play by play of it because you weren't watching this at all. You were just you were see I, I guess absorbing this. Through social media, and I guess whatever I was sending you. So um, I clicked on Twitter, and everyone's talking about how, like, very clearly something had happened. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, "Oh my god, he hit him!" And da 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 da. What happened was trending on Twitter. Like the second it happened, everyone was like, "Did that just happen? That real?" Da 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 da. So of course, I click on the first video, and I saw it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's real. You can tell that's real." Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just laughed. Um, I was like, yeah, I needed this. Okay. <laughs> it's it, the, the only thing I hate, and this is what worries me, is we can't just have fun shit like this anymore. Um, like, by this, by the next day, I was tired of it. Because people... <laughs> We're just like taking sides and like taking it so goddamn seriously. And okay, I guess assault is serious, you know? Sure. Um, but by day two, people were, were, were maybe not even by day two, but by uh, not even that long after, people were, were taking this moment and using it to, to, um, and co opting it for their own like political me- agendas. Yeah, I, it, it just became this whole thing. And I'm just like, please just shut up. Yeah, a dude got slapped. It happens. Um, I'm, I mean, yeah, I don't even want to give my opinion on it, like, as far as, like, is that okay or not? Because uh, it doesn't matter. I don't know. Um, Chris Rock could have pressed charges. He didn't. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I just thought when I first saw it, I was like, that's funny. And you could tell it was real. Because yeah. I think Chris Rock thought he was going to... He was doing, like, a a bit with him. Like, maybe he was going to come up and be like, oh, I'm going to get you, you know. That's what everybody thought when when the the camera cut to Will Smith getting up. Yeah. And and if you see in the video Chris Walk, you know, he's like, oh, like, here he comes. You know, he thinks it's all a joke. And then he even leans in to, like, hear what he's going to say. And then the... 
and then boom, he hits him. And you could tell by the reaction, Chris Rock was like shocked. Um, yeah. And then, of course, the point where I'm like 100% real is when, because I saw this later than I guess everyone else did. So I saw it with the footage of him clearly yelling like, yes, keep my wife's name out of your fucking mouth and you know just like screaming it at the top you of said it twice yeah twice and chris rock is like really you know <laughs> like okay um yeah i don't know it's 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 just a funny thing that happened i think people take it too seriously because you you could obviously there is things you can pull out of this you know did Chris Rock take it a step too far with the joke he said? Did Will Smith have a right to defend his wife um, in the way that he did? Um, uh, uh, you can get into a million things. I just don't think they're interesting enough or worth it to have those conversations or important enough to have those conversations. But people want it, like, they just don't shut up about it. Like, they want to turn it into, like, I don't know. A scandal? Like, a, a, this massive scandal and da-da-da-da-da. Um, I mean, I'll say this. If the Academy asked him to, like, after he hit Chris Walk, like, get the fuck out, I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> if I, if... And yet they couldn't make up their minds what to do oh, about that. thing you who's just about to win. Yeah, and ratings. Oh, I know. <laughs> I never believed that. Like, oh yeah, we asked him to leave. Bullshit. <laughs> oh, you, bullshit. Yeah. Any, <laughs> I feel bad for the poor, like fucking um, middle management or whatever, just underling that they have with with a mic who's maybe been working there for two weeks. That they're like, go tell Will Smith he needs to leave. <laughs> you know what would happen? <laughs> He'd probably just ignore him, just be like, like, excuse me? I don't, like, like, he'd probably just give him one of those, like, just get the fuck out of my face. Like, you're nobody, I ain't moving, none of that. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there exists a possibility where one of those underlings were put to the task and the, and asked Smith to leave, and then the actual pro, um, producer of the show went up to him and, and made him know that it was okay that he remained mm. and that actually happened um the producer of the show did tell him it's, it was okay he could stay oh yeah of course because when it's well that's it's his Will job Smith. Yeah. and two he was he was just about to win right like how yeah. weird would it be like <laughs> i don't know i think they the second year in a row they the best actor is out there to collect the the oscar <laughs> <laughs> i think that would have made for much sweeter television. Because you know why? You have Jada accept the reward for him. <laughs> or you have Chris Rock go up there and be like, uh, my good friend Will had to had to go home. Oh my god. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and accept it for him. <laughs> that would have been great. That would have been so funny. <laughs> Um, and I guess I do understand why a lot of entertainers and a lot of like, yeah, comedians and stuff like that, I understand why they're freaking out because they don't want to get hit. Like if, no, if, who does? If, if this is, I think in their minds of like, if this is normalized, if this action of everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's funny, it's okay, it's whatever, then it's open season, right? <laughs> and on, mm -hmm. on, on, you know, they'll be begging for to be quote unquote canceled, you know, <laughs> if the next time they joke about someone's wife in the audience, that's like free reign to just get beat the fuck up. Um, so there's that. And then also, I will say there are there were some people that were hardcore defending Will Smith, but were the same people 
that when it came to the, the trans jokes that Dave Chappelle were making was like, people need to get over it. Cancel culture, da 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 da. You know, I'm I'm sorry. You can't sit there and be like, "Hey, First Amendment comedy cancel culture." When it came to the kind of jokes Dave Chappelle was making, but then back up, uh, Will Smith literally physically assaulting someone because they made a "Your wife is bald" bald joke. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, I saw that happen in real time, and I have to be honest with you, was, I was genuinely having a good time watching the show, uh, and then that happened, and um, I get your perspective saying it was funny, I don't think it was funny to me, because it really made me feel so uncomfortable, because like, I was, I was watching the event in real time, mm -hmm. live, and then for the rest of the night, like... You're watching that show and every minute of it. <laughs> What's going to happen? So, and it's just so awkward. Yeah, no. And it, it, is. And it, and it, it made it, it, it made it very uncomfortable to be there. And it actually got so, like, the, look, the thing in and of itself was weird to see happen in real time because the joke that Chris Rock made, Will Smith laughed at. That, oh, see, that's another thing. I don't want to get into Will Smith and his family dynamics. I don't want to get into it but, either, but we all know what their dynamic yeah. is. I'm not. Let, everybody knows what it is. I'm, we're gonna leave it at that. But, and again, I I do not want to come off as somebody that wants to be mean to him, or even more so than other people. But let's be real here. The guy hit somebody else. That's not okay. Maybe I shouldn't be so charitable to him right now. But he laughed at the joke, mm -hmm. and I can only assume the reason why he went up and did what he did was because he, at the same time that we saw Will Smith's reaction and him laughing to Chris Rock's joke, we saw Jada's reaction, and she was not happy with it. She was pissed. Mm -hmm. And so it is not unreasonable to assume, and again, that's all we're doing here is assuming, that because of how sensitive their relationship happens to be, he overcompensated. See, that's the part that makes it funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> But it's sad. It's very though. sad. He ruined his own moment. I, and I, I yes. Good night. I don't want to get into it, but it is this thing of like, Will, you're the biggest star in the world. Come on, dude. Like, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like, go, 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 be with Harley Quinn. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Grace, did you see Grace made a little bit of a of a comment about the only comment she made about the the relationship between Jada and Will was like, this is, this is her words verbatim. For some reason, Will Smith wants to make this marriage work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that kind of says it, basically. <sighs> and again, yeah. OK, I, I will get more into it because it's, it's so stupid. Um but to me, it's ah man. I really wish they would have kept that camera on them a second longer. Yeah, I'm so annoyed because it happens so fast. Because you see him laughing like ah, ha, ha. and then you see the and then you too. see her like like she rolls her eyes like annoyed, and then it cuts to Chris Rock, and then like a few seconds later, Will Smith is is walking. He's walking up there. I, I, I can almost guarantee if the camera was had stayed on them, you would have seen a look. Like <laughs> either she looked at him and he's like, "Oh shit!" I realize she's real pissed. Or like he's laughing. He notices. He notices, and then just like boom, the laughing stops. Like you would have seen something like that. Uh, but yeah, no, to me, that's part of what makes the whole situation. Well, to me, it's funny because it's absurd. It is absurd. Like the Oscars, the night, the people involved. It's another thing too, right? Because Will Smith, very well liked in general, but also Chris Rock, very well liked in general. Beloved. Yeah, for sure. So that's what also kind of makes it, I think that's why it also feels a little clicky. The way like people pick sides, or, like there, there's no side to pick. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. It's the whole the whole just thing was just so absurd. And yeah, that that element of 
he laughed at the joke, but then she clearly was annoyed. <laughs> makes you wonder. Yeah. It kind of makes you think about what actually happened there. But then he, he actually did it, and everybody was like, okay, but did that really happen? And yeah, it happened. And I was actually recording it and not knowing that moment was going to happen. And I think at some point you hear me kind of like open my mouth, like, what did I just see? And, but uh, it ruined the night though. And it, it ruined it. It, it, it just it like, completely. well, it's not even overshadowing it, which it did, but it just like, it was fun. Actually, I was having a good time watching the show and then I wasn't. <laughs> and then I just, and then I feel like everybody in the room and watching it, Maybe not watching at home, but everybody in the room was like, okay, can we just leave now? Why are we still here? <laughs> Why are we still here? And, then, and then there was a lot of, like, chatter about people from inside the actual Adobe that were, like, wondering, why is there still a show going on? Or is, like, nothing going to happen with this? Like, is it no one else weird, weirded out by the fact that we're, just, we're, <laughs> we're continuing on with the ceremony as is, as if nothing had happened? That doesn't – no. I, I think that makes 100 – that's how it always works. The show must go it on. Always, yeah, like, they, they, yeah. they, they do the best – because there's professionals right behind the show. Yeah. They're not just going to stop the show for, a, no, for fucking anything. No, no, no. Someone could have a heart we attack on Will stage. Will was going to, yeah. yeah. Will was going to win his Oscar and we're going to see him mm -hmm. do the speech. And that's going to like do great for us with the ratings. So like the thing is the, the act in and of itself was pretty unfortunate. And I just, I felt bad for Chris Rock because he clearly wasn't expecting it. He didn't deserve that. And Will Smith to just so casually do that was just kind of disturbing on a personal <laughs> level. And I think, it, I think to me, the most disturbing element out of all of this was people defending it immediately and still to this day. Yeah, I don't. I don't care what the excuse is. That. I don't mm -hmm. care if his marriage is not right. I don't care if he felt offended or whatever because of his family. There are better ways to like get the public on your side for like a tasteless joke, if that was what you felt the joke was like. But it, it, mm -hmm. it, it the idea that he went up there and he hit somebody, and he, by all appearances, based on how the rest of the night. He walked away with an Oscar. He didn't walk away because he was escorted out. It gives off the appearance that it was okay to do these things. And that's why people are so pissed off, as you said. That's why especially comedians are so scared about Ooh, yeah, what because does this mean. I think what also scared them is how mild the joke is. It wasn't... Right? <laughs> <laughs> like... It's like, oh, she's bold. Like, okay. And it's like, you could say like... Amy Schumer called Jennifer Lawrence fat that same night. <laughs> they are best friends, though. Um, yeah, I know. I guess for me, it's like... Well, one, if you want to argue like, hey, it's not cool to make fun of something maybe someone's sensitive about or, you know, whatever. It's like, sure, yes, 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 okay. The thing is, if you go to the Oscars, to me, that's kind of part of it, right? If you're mm -hmm. at the Oscars and you're famous... There's a good chance you're going to get some light ribbing, right? Deal with it. <laughs> you're you're at the fucking Oscars. That's like being at the the front row at some show at SeaWorld and being mad when you get wet. <laughs> Not saying you're always going to get wet, more than likely you might though. And if if you're worried about that, then don't show up. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Um, but what made it worse, though, was, um, by the way, props to Chris Rock, because he, he kept it going. He recovered pretty nicely on live television. Like, if that were me, like, I don't know how you just, like, move on from that and, like, do your job. So good for him. Yeah, no. How he was able to, like, manage all of that. And, of course, bad for Questlove, because he won the Oscar moments after this happened. I was so disappointed in Will, like. Come on, you can't even knock Chris Rock on your ass. You're supposed to be this oh action God. hero. Don't don't do that. Let's not. It was a slap though. It wasn't a punch. You can smack the so shit I... out of someone. They they fall down onto the ground. Yes. With us. Okay. Well. Anyway, <laughs> what really made it worse for Will mm -hmm. was he had an, he had a, a tremendous opportunity to completely turn that night around. And from what I understand, they were making – he and his, like, uh, publicists were making changes to his speech. It ended up not being the correct changes because he had an opportunity with the speech to really turn the whole thing around with a sincere apology. Did you listen to that speech? 
wasn't it something where it's like you know you got to defend your family i think you said some shit like that right it was horrendous <laughs> it was absolutely horrendous because he basically in real time was tying what he did to Chris Rock in with the character he portrayed in King Richard and using it to justify what happened. I told you though, Richard was a shit character. <laughs> but you know what happened in the news afterward, right? Mm, the um, King Richard himself, he's still alive, by the way. Yeah, I just so. And he issued, he issued a statement condemning violence and what Will Smith did. <laughs> That's pretty bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, it didn't sit well with me. It was a, it was a long ass six minute rambling speech and he was invoking God and love with justifying why he was acting, saying like, love will make you do crazy things. And he apologized to everybody except Chris Rock. And that also didn't sit well with me. Because clearly he's not sorry. (laughs) No, he's not. But it's like. It was honestly like one of the most disgusting speeches I've heard ever given at one of these things. And I don't think that's what Will was trying to say, but that's how it came off. (laughs) So that's all that. And then all the days that people are still talking about this because now the Academy, like it's a, he said, she said thing like, Oh, we did ask him to leave. Oh, we did actually not ask him to leave. That's the part where it's like, okay, just shut up now. Like, yeah, we're ready to move on from this. It's it's a whole thing. Because even now, they're anyway. like, he could face disciplinary action. Okay. Either do it or don't do it. Or, like, I, I don't need to update every five minutes of, of like, whatever <laughs> thought. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I'll, I'll give you an update if uh, Disney ever corrects um, that, that interview where they called Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Marvel Studios Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and see what happens there. Uh, I'll give you the play-by-play of that. Of course. Yeah, because that's what matters, right? Um, Before we move on to the movies, should we say anything about Ezra Miller? Um, I hope he gets the help he needs. Very, very clearly needs. Why do you think that's not getting more attention? Because he's already just a known crazy person. So, for those that are not aware, Ezra Miller was first um, arrested this past weekend um, for getting in repeated bar fights. He was the he was called on ten times uh, by the police. Didn't he for the bust into him. someone's hotel room? No, that's not what okay. happened. This is a, this is this is how weird the situation is. That whole weekend, Ezra Miller was just staying with some people he randomly met in Hawaii. Like this random couple that he met allowed him to stay at their home. Oh. So they were out partying at this bar. He got belligerently drunk. And then he was like assaulting people and threatening people on stage doing karaoke. He was then arrested. The people he was staying with bailed him out that night. And that same night, the people who bailed him out and who he's staying with, Ezra Miller barged into their bedroom, threatened to murder them, and then stole their belongings and ran away. (laughs) in a flash um (laughs) best oscar moment right um (laughs) i mean by the way perfect timing by the way because this is the week that the the dumbledore movie um (laughs) had its premiere and its press tour i will say um i feel bad because i said I don't think, and of course, I can't know at all. He doesn't seem like he's a bad person. He genuinely just seems mentally ill. And that's terrible. Yeah. He needs help, and he seems like no one's helping him. And you have to wonder, where is Warner Brothers in all of this? Because think about this. The star of their big Flash movie is now getting a restraining order filed against him from people who allegedly he threatened to kill. Not great. <laughs> After already and being it, arrested it, that night. 
And this comes after two years. Remember what happened two years ago? That video that surfaced from Europe where he he choked a woman and beat her down to the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and nothing was ever said or done about that. And I'm not laughing because it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it's funny that he did that. It's just funny because it's absurd. Yeah, now you're thinking like me, right? <laughs> it's that... See, that's the thing that... Because... I guess for me, the reason why it gets less attention, because like with the Will Smith and Chris Rock thing, it's absurd and it's funny, but there's very clear you human, understandable human elements to it, right? Where it's like you understand in the situation, this human acted this way, this one, this one. With him, uh, Ezra Miller, he's just being crazy. Like he's just crazy. He's just doing things like there's no like if Ezra Miller got in a beef with Jason Momoa because Jason Momoa talks shit about his ex-girlfriend, right? It's like, OK, these are human human reactions that I can wrap my head around, even if I don't agree with them, even if I think they're over the top, I can wrap my head around the thought process and and. The reactions with Ezra Miller, I can't. I don't. I've never just randomly stayed with people I never knew, and then got drunk and then busted open their 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 bedroom <laughs> door and been like, "I'm gonna kill you, you motherfucker!" <laughs> like there is no rhyme or reason. It's a some men just want to watch the bur world burn scenario. <laughs> I, I just like, how do you see this improving the situation with he him? needs help is this is this part of why the film was pushed back so far away? I don't think so because because I know the film is it's done. the film is shot for whatever reason he's as an actor, right? He seems to be pretty game and willing because there are some crazy actors where it's like, oh God, like it's hell on set, right? I mean, he is difficult on set from what I've heard, but he still is but there. He's, he's game still, and, and he's he, doing it yeah. and he wants it to happen and work. He wants its success, right? Um, whereas with other actors might just be like, I'm a star and they show up and they act shitty. Uh, so, yeah, I think the only thing that gets better is if they put his ass in some facility, uh, See a therapist, get some drugs. Not the type, not this typical Hollywood type, like the the, <laughs> the guy that'll help him out. He, yeah, he needs like real help, not just hey, stay out of the limelight for a little bit. You know, keep keep a low profile. No, he's a little bit more than that. I'm just scared that something worse can still happen. Oh, for sure, right? And then. Like yeah. a mat, because yeah, imagine the press tour. That'll be fun. Well, since we're done with that, shall we go ahead and get into the movies that we saw? Yes, we shall. Shall we start in with the order that we um, saw them? That's in? what I was gonna do. Great. Okay. Let's. Oh, well, we did a double feature recently. A very interesting one. In that, it was an advanced screening of Morbius. <laughs> uh, never. So we saw the Lost City of D. I like to add the of D. Directed by Adam Nee and Aaron Nee. Oh, the irony! The adventure is real. The heroes are not. Follows a reclusive romance novelist who was sure nothing could be worse than getting stuck on a book tour with her cover model until a kidnapping attempt sweeps them both into a cutthroat jungle adventure, proving life can be so much stranger and more romantic than any of her paperback fictions. Starring Sandra Bullock, Channing Tatum, Daniel Radcliffe, Brad Pitt, Divine Joy Randolph, Patty Harrison, Oscar Nunez, other people. And director Adam Nee Aaron Nee. There you go. <clears throat> it's 
So, what did you think of The Lost City of D? It was nice to see an actual comedy in a theater again. Right. I c- can't even remember the last time I did that. Um, and that honestly was what was motivating me to go see this film. And I really liked the trailers for it. And I honestly didn't even see a single review or saw how it was received from the critics um, at all. I, I, I just I wanted to see this for myself. I am a fan of Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum and these kind of movies. And I don't think, at least in my case, I I was very taken with what I saw. I was very um, pleased with it. Um, Not at all disappointed. Because this basically felt like a movie, an ordinary film on a random Saturday I would see if it were 10 years ago (laughs) because 10 or 15 years ago, these films were a dime a dozen. Uh, They were everywhere. And so if this had been released at that point, it would not at all seem like special or unique. In fact, it would be very ordinary. It may even be forgotten, but in 2022, it gets like it's, it stands out because you realize many of these films just aren't made anymore. Um, I thought this was actually pretty good. I like Bullock and Channing Tatum's chemistry in this. And I don't think anything here really is all is like revelatory or um, much to write home about in the way of like new. It's, it's very much standard, but it's also, it's sweet and endearing and cute. And you're not at any point. I feel like, Put off by anything feeling like it's pandering or it's like oh this is like really just like vile or like lazy or lame no it actually is pretty fun all the way throughout um and i don't know i i was entertained i i really enjoyed it and i actually really liked the uh dynamic with tatum and bullock together um yeah I mean, you know what this movie is going to be when you see the trailer. Oh, yes. Um, but um, it was highly entertained. Yeah, I I had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> it, it, does, it definitely feels like one of those throwback movies. Um, <laughs> you know, of course, starring Sandra Bullock. But those are fun. I miss seeing them in the theaters. And guess what? We saw it in the theaters. A lot of, I don't know if you noticed this, a lot of women in the audience. Oh, I noticed it, yeah. <laughs> uh, we were one of the few non, I guess. Uh, but no, I, I, everyone laughed. There's a, The theater enjoyed it, you could tell. Um, I agree, I love the chemistry between Tatum and Miss Bullock. I think they're both really funny. And are able to pull off, you know, the the sweet romance stuff. Again, not revolutionary, but no. fun and funny. I laughed quite a few times and I had a good time. And yeah, it was fun. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, throw it on, a couple laughs, have fun. Why not? Yeah, and I have to think it's... um. Easily better than half the schlock that Netflix puts out of this variety in particular. Like, honestly, a lot of this, a lo- there are some similarities with like what the film was going for with a pretty high profile film last year from Netflix called Red Notice with The Rock, Gal Gadot, and Ryan Reynolds. And that film was just abysmal, abysmal <laughs> in every regard. It was also a globe-trotting film, like uh, this one right here, The Lost City. Yeah. Um, unlike you, I did not watch that. So, I because from the trailers, I'm like, "Yep, this is that movie." So I didn't watch Red Notice. No, but this one, um, a lot of fun, well made. I think, just overall. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I appreciate that it's well yeah. made. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. Not much to say <laughs> other than the. Oh, shout out to Brad Pitt. He was my uh, favorite role. part of the film. He was great. I knew the turn that they're gonna take with this character. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so stupid. Yeah, no, I gotta say though, my it's like um, this is one of those films that if it had it had come out in the late two thousands, I could definitely see this like being one of my favorites because like it, it just reminded me of those kind of films. Like, um, let me see here. Crazy Stupid Love. Yeah. From 2011. Um, there is also even like other films that no one talks about, but are actually like really fun in their own way. Remember this movie called Mad Money with yeah, Diane Keaton and Queen Latifah? Mm-hmm. Like, again, so many of these. There's also another one with Queen Latifah called Last Holiday. Like, so many of these like films that were just like. They were the norm. The bread and butter. Yeah, they're, yeah. They were very. Big, I think the the holiday made in made obviously. in Manhattan with J Lo. Yeah, yeah. Also, another wait, "Marry Me" could have been from earlier. Yeah, that's this another year. one, one of those like films. A throwback yeah. with the with the same actresses that would have been earlier, right? <laughs> and this is the first uh, like actual like comedy Sandra Bullock has done since The Heat. Uh, from 2013 or 14, I believe. Yeah, I I had read somewhere yeah. that she was, she was really adamant on making this film. Really? Yeah, and like she's the one that made it happen. Apparently, she had to make a couple phone calls and raise her voice a little bit. But uh, <laughs> oh my god, she got the movie made. It's also great, great to see Channing Tatum back in something successful. It's been a while. <laughs> And it reminds you, like, why he's such a great comedic actor. He's great. He he really. I think he really does have a a presence. You know, absolutely. I I didn't really think about it until now, but he could have also been a really good option for um, Shazam. Hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, I could see yeah. that. Yeah. But he was busy doing Gambit. <laughs> <laughs> no one talks about that. We don't talk about Gambit. No. And right now, if you're a fan of Channing Tatum, you got two movies right now at the at the multiplex. You got The Lost City of D, and you also got a uh, dog. Dog. That's it. Dog. Yeah. <laughs> so good for him. And you know what? What really made me happy, though, Peter, about all of this is. Um, did you see those opening box office numbers? Yeah, it did real good. Because, come, I mean, I also saw that, you know, money-wise it did good, but demographics-wise, mostly women, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I'm sure it was this thing of, like, there hasn't been one of these like this in a while. In ages? Yeah. So... <laughs> A lot of women finally went back to the the multiplex, which is great. It's a home for everyone. Yeah, let me actually read this because I think this is actually a pretty interesting story. Uh, Screen Rant apparently did this and uh, written by a female writer, uh, Kristen Brown. Uh, the new romantic comedy, Lost City, has exceeded expectations with its box office performance during its opening weekend. Since premiering on March 25th, the Lost City has earned $31 million at the domestic box office, dethroning the Batman for the number one position after three weekends in a row. Um, let's see here. With a budget of $68 million. Wow. The Lost City was, well, I guess for a comedy, was expensive for a romantic comedy. This budget went toward not only paying the numerous popular actors in the movie, but filming a location on the Dominican Republic during the pandemic. The cost seems to have paid off, though, with the Lost City's strong opening. Um, a major reason for the movie's success is the positive reception it has enjoyed among both audiences and reviewers. Um, currently having a 75% of Rotten Tomatoes, which 
is a big factor with general audiences determining which films to like bothering to pay money to go see. Um, yeah, a large portion of the budget went to several big name actors, of course, with Bullock and Tatum. Also, we forgot to mention here, what did you think of Daniel Radcliffe in this film? Oh, he was fantastic, I thought. Wasn't yeah. he? Like, he's one of those actors that's just like, he's always looking for something new and different mm-hmm. to do. I appreciate that, especially coming off like a notable character as like Harry Potter of all things. Yeah, I think he always says that. He's like, the greatest thing about doing Harry Potter is um, I get to choose the projects I want to do. I don't got I don't got to worry about money. So when I act, I do I act in whatever. If I'm acting it, it's because I want to do it, <laughs> basically. And you can tell in everything he does. Yeah, female fueled uh, opening weekend uh, for. It's just a good story to see like a different kind of movie be proclaimed a box office winner in this day and age. Because usually, like, it's just become, like, especially with 2021, so many films, um, no, the only kind of films, I should say, that actually were good at box office-wise were Marvel movies. And so it's just nice to see an original comedy, like, doing gangbusters. And $31 million in the pandemic is gangbusters, so. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, so go and see it. It'll make for a good day. Good time. It was really fun. It's really fun. It's just like it, it's, it's a nice laid back feel. It's like, okay, I can just sit here and have fun. And that's enough for me for this movie. Oh, for sure. That's great. (laughs) Yeah. And then follow it up with drive my car. No, no, maybe not. Not the best of double features or the green Knight. No, Um, no, no. um, Or X. What would you pair? What, what, what other comedy would, I would bear it with X. You know, you know what? For I don't know what it is. We don't plan it out this way, but like a lot of the double features that you and I go through, kind of pair pretty nicely. <laughs> you wouldn't think it, but yeah, that was the next film we saw. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I will describe it to you, X, directed by Ty West, dying to show you a good time. In 1979, a group of young filmmakers set out to make an adult film in a secluded farmhouse in rural Texas. Their reclusive, elderly hosts take a special interest in their young guests, and as night falls in, the couple's leering interest takes a violent turn. Starring Mia Goth, Jenna Ortega, Brittany Snow, Kid Cudi, Martin Henderson, Owen Campbell, Stephen Urry, James Galen, okay, other people, and directed by <laughs> Ty West. <laughs> um, I had no, well, I knew it was like a horror slash. Wait a minute, is this thing going, wait, wait, I'm sorry to cut you off. Is this thing real that Alexis shared? What? Saw Morbius tonight and there was only one other dude there took a pic and accidentally had flash on yeah that's real okay <laughs> that's pretty funny okay sorry that's so creepy who's watching morbius uh, honestly though who cares that guy. <laughs> oh, okay um i all i knew about this movie was it's a horror movie it's a slasher a24 good reviews okay let's go see it that's literally all I knew. I think I knew the porn stuff, maybe. I don't remember. I did not know about that. All I knew was that it was A24 and it was horror. And that usually is enough for me to go. <laughs> of course. I don't need to see anything else. Yes. <laughs> Those are all the prerequisites necessary. Any A24 film that we get in our theater, I feel like I'm obligated you to see. have to. Because, uh, you know, you, you rarely see those kinds of films in movie theaters here. Well, really anywhere at this point. So, yeah, I really didn't know what to expect with this film. And to say the least, it kept me on my toes. I thought pretty early on I knew what kind of film it was. And then I, it kept going and I'm like, well, maybe I don't know. And then it kept going and I was like, wait, well, maybe I still don't know. (laughs) 
It is a hell of a ride. I I will say we had it really is. We had a little bit of a um crowd, not crazy, but those those yeah. people. Anything is a crowd where or for an A twenty four film that's not just you and me. Yes, that's true. And I thought for a second that it might be like that, but no, there was there was a a few people, and I don't want to say it's a crowd pleaser, but you should see it with the crowd. Because the reactions are priceless. <laughs> this is a, a, a some it, it in a lot of ways traditional and in a lot of ways strange film. By the end of it, I had <laughs> a a really good time. I thought it was a lot of fun, and I would I would definitely recommend it. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. What do you think? Oh no, I I really had a great time with it. I I, I liked it uh, quite a bit. Um, it in and of itself almost felt like a throwback, right? Like to just like oh, it's just it, it's just a, a slasher horror film, and it plays out. Um, once the film gets going in that regard as a slasher fairly plays out the way that you would expect it to but it is i would say deliberate in its execution that it doesn't automatically start off as a slasher because it has a very um uh pace about it (laughs) It has a very pace about it um i mean that it takes a bit to get going as to like what kind of movie it's actually going to be um, and establishing these uh, these characters that are on the road, basically, um, and making uh, adult films. Uh, but then they arrive at a certain destination, and it's like, okay, well, now I see what's going to happen here. Because you just get creepy <laughs> vibes almost immediately from there, and then you get like creepy-ass like old people, and they're like, okay, this shit's not going to end well. It reminds you, but then again, like the film opens with everybody dead, so I guess... They they do a good job of making you forget. Oh yeah, that that happens. Oh, that is gonna happen at some point, and we're gonna see it. No, the audience really made it. Um, because it was funny to hear their reactions. Because there were like moments of absolute like weird. I guess you could call qualify it as like art house moments. Mm-hmm. Um, with the slasher because um our main slasher, um the first kill that uh they made, they then like do some kind of performative dance after the fact. <laughs> like, uh, and it was like, and, and to hear people's like reaction to it was like pretty hilarious. And I appreciated <laughs> that. Yeah. It's, um, well, I, I say several times, I was like, I, I'm not sure I know what this film is going to be because I feel like the movie at first, I'm like, okay, slow burn taking its time. But after a while I was like, is this horror? I feel like most of the film... At that point, it was more funny. It's it's just them making this porno. Yeah. Like, there's little things here and there where it's like, ooh, something sinister might happen. But then there isn't, right? Because, like, there are, of course, the old people that own the house, and and they make them seem sinister. But then they just make them seem like old people, you know? And and you, you just kind of feel bad for them. And even the sinister stuff, it's like, well, maybe it's a misdirect. Because most of the film does just seem to be like these characters making this movie. And I got to say, I think they did a really good job with like giving a shit about these characters. I thought all of them were interesting. Like the, 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 yeah, the, yeah. the, the group of people they had together. Because usually in these type of slasher fix, it's like, okay, you hate everyone. Maybe you like the main character, but I thought all of them were well acted and entertaining. Like I thought the um the sleazy uh owner producer guy, I thought um the actor did a really good job with him. I thought he was really <laughs> entertaining. No, he was yeah. very much so. Yeah. But yeah, no, then you do hit a point where it's like, oh, okay, now we're getting into some of the stuff I thought we were, but it's not in the way I thought it would be. 
Mm-hmm. And then there is some disturbing stuff, but not in the way you thought it would be. Uh, the disturbing stuff. And then also what the movie's about, um, I thought was pretty interesting and pretty fun. And then the, the way that they mess with it. I don't see this is the thing. I don't know if anyone would qualify this as like straight up horror comedy. But I think there is a lot there's enough that I might. There's enough of it in there that I might. Because there are several moments in the film where it feels like it's like switching back and forth in terms of tone. Yeah. Because you see a really hilarious scene happening with people literally fucking the shit out of each other. And then we cut back to this weird old lady who's having a moment, but there's like the horror movie music mm-hmm. playing over it. Yeah. But even mo- like the final kill in this movie was very humorous. <laughs> um, With the shotgun. Oh, <laughs> which time? The last time it's fired. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Humorous, but then also it's like, yes, there are other moments throughout the film like that. Like, and there are some, some interesting kills that kind of evoke an 80s horror slasher, like someone gets eaten by an alligator. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, because y- y- the kills are very much like Friday at the 13th level. They're uh-huh. all no CG. All real effects, all look very real. The style of the film very much pulls from like 70s, uh, late 70s, early 80s. What was the best kill? The best kill? Um, let me think. Well, like grotesque, I would say yeah. like the first one. Because they really go in on it. <laughs> Oh yeah. Mhm. What about um the second one though? With the one of the main guys, like he gets his eyes stabbed out by a pitchfork. Yeah. That's pretty bad. I I I liked the head crushing just cuz I the effects were really good <laughs> at the, the at the very end. No, there was a lot of Oh yeah, yeah. Quote right. unquote good kills. <laughs> Which is Uh obviously what you're looking for in a slasher. So if you are looking for that in in this film, it is there. It's not so subversive that it doesn't have those aspects or qualities to it. The things that you want to see out of a slasher. Mm -hmm. It's there. For sure. Um, No, I I really liked it. It's a Um, little art house porn (laughs) meets... Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. I have to say that for however uncomfortable I was with um, the Oscars uh, after Will Smith hit Chris Rock and then everybody and watching everyone in the room just like having to be there. Th- the day before when we saw this film, one of the most skin crawling things I've ever seen put to film was seeing... <laughs> Two elderly people engage in uh, sexual intercourse, the especially the way that it was presented. And again, this is where the audience reaction really like helps enhance the experience because then you hear and you feel everyone else's discomfort in the audience. I think what makes it funny though is this is after oh, spoilers, by the way. Um, this is after. They just like murdered a fuck ton of people. Yeah. And our main heroine it was a massacre. Is like hiding under the bed. Right? And so again, I, like we've been saying throughout this whole uh time, the absurdity is what makes it funny to me. Right? Be- because like uh, the, the the murders are kind of just all based on their insecurity. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's so absurd and ridiculous reason to like murder people for. So yeah, tie that in with everything else, and the fact that yeah, it's kind of 
uncomfortable and gross in of itself. It's just, to me, it was hilarious. I was like, okay. And all this happens because uh, that old grandma is just horny. Yeah, for sure. Uh, like she, she that that scene where she crawls in the bed uh, with um, yeah. Oh my god, that was disgusting. <laughs> she just wanted to cuddle. It was fine. Oh uh, okay. Um, but then of course it was implied that they had they had done this to other people. Yeah. Um, you can imagine the same thing happening where it's like. They get people to stay, rent out their little cabin or something. The wife gets a little too uh, excited and causing uh, murders in the process. And her husband kind of goes along with it. He blames them. Because <laughs> yeah. he says, like, you people came in strutting around, getting her all excited. I am. Um, but yeah, no, I, it's a, it's a lot of fun. And I know that sounds weird. <laughs> they, Horror films are fun. They though. are. They, they a are. lot of them are like malignant. So much Hello? fun. So much goddamn fun. Oh, but this is another I one. just saw it the other night, by the <laughs> way. You rewatched. Yeah. It's, it's fucking amazing. to cut out the cancer. I love the music. It's so over the top. <laughs> um, it's another one that should have won an Oscar. See if those Snyder people didn't exist. They should have won all the it Oscars. It could have won a um, uh, <laughs> fan favorite. <laughs> that would have been great. No, but X. Definitely, definitely watch it. Oh, by the way, uh, Malignant fans, the film is doing so well, apparently, it has now generated a 4K release, which will come out later in the year. Really? Yeah. So they... That's how... Originally, there was no 4K release. It was just a regular Blu-ray. I, I have the, the Blu-ray. But there was enough interest where they just... A WB announced a 4K is coming this year. That's cool. So I, that's how they're doing it now then, I guess, right? Just checking how, whether it's worth it, how it does, popular, yeah. how well it does. If there's enough interest mm-hmm. for it. No, that's great. And it couldn't happen to a better film. Oh, uh, I agree. Well, um, that brings us basically to the end of the show. Um, Peter, we're basically now in April, and the Oscars are entirely behind us so um is it time is it that time of year again is it time to sit down by the campfire and um talk about our favorite films of the year uh, it's it's very cl- i only have a couple more films so uh, yeah it's it's basically time yes I received, I don't know if you caught um, in all the chaos that transpired on Sunday in the message chat, but I received word from our uh, very own Kyle Lara, and he has declared that his top five are officially locked. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I'm surprised. Mm-hmm. Last year, I was like pulling teeth to get him to make one. And when you say last year, you mean like uh, yeah, three, like months, three ago? months ago? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it happens at the end of the year because he took him the whole year. True. It they, it was one hundred percent his fault. It was on him. Like we could have given a top ten of twenty twenty literally like by like June of that yeah. last year. You're all welcome, by the way. And we did it in December because Kyle. <laughs> For 2020, not 2021. This upcoming one will be 2021. 
Um, is anything a lock for you? Um, yeah, a, a few. But you know me, I like to just finish it and then make the list. Yeah. Well, I have to, I, I think my top 10 is as close to a lock as it's going to get. So, um, and I'm quite happy with it. I'm quite happy with the films. Um, and I can't wait to discuss all of these wonderful movies for the end of the year. Or, not the end of the year, but, well, you know what yeah. I mean. Anyway, thank you all for listening. Um, we got plenty more shows coming at you. Remember that David and I are doing Moon Knight recaps. And yeah, stay under our spotlight for more content, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.